I had grown to know Reverend Robert L. Bradby and Reverend William Peck, loyal customers and lifelong friends who supported and advised me in my business. I also came to know famous people such as Joe Lewis, who was experiencing a successful career in boxing. In 1943, before the riot, 60% of my customers were white. This changed dramatically after the riot. On a quiet Sunday afternoon, a fight occurred between black and white youth near Belle Isle. A rumor quickly spread that a black woman and child had been thrown over the bridge into the Detroit River. For the next 24 hours, the city erupted into the worst race riot the nation had experienced, resulting in 35 dead, 530 injured, 1,300 jail, and 1,188 prosecutions. The riot would leave a deep racial scar on Detroit. For me, while I regained the pre-riot level of business, I would never regain the same patronage from whites and suffer discrimination in many ways. In 1944, the Studebaker zone manager attempted to take my franchise. The banks refused loans to expand my business, and on business trips, hotels, and restaurants refused service to my wife and me and I was denied participation in local and national business associations. While many whites blocked my path, many others helped. In 1949, I was nominated for the presidency of the Studebaker Dealer Association of Detroit. I also served a number of years as chairperson for the Studebaker Group United Foundation annual fundraising drive. In 1953, I began losing money at my Studebaker dealership as the public began losing confidence in the car. Three years later, in 1956, Studebaker went out of business. That same year, I attempted without success to obtain a franchise with one of the big three automotive companies. Chrysler promised me a dealership but bowed to pressure from the white dealers who believed I would take their black businesses. I then turned my attention to other businesses in which I was invested, such as the Victory Loan Company. Back in 1941, I and four other black businessmen in Detroit started the Victory Loan Company to provide the black community with small loans. At the same time, I joined Floyd Rice Ford as a sub-dealer with the hopes of eventually obtaining a dealership. In 1961, Congressman Charles C. Diggs, Jr., introduced me as the National Business League Outstanding Businessman. Finally, in July 1963, a lucky break came. Lynn Townsend, president of Chrysler, gave a speech in Detroit before the National Newspaper Publishers Association, a black newspaper association. Before Townsend's speech to the publishers, a friend of the Michigan Chronicle, George Cutler, raised a question to Townsend of why there were no new black car dealers. Townsend answered, we're looking for dealers, and we don't care who they are as long as they are qualified. Cutler responded, well, I know who would qualify, Ed Davis. At that moment, he introduced me to Len Townsend. After several months of raising the finance and participating in intensive negotiation with Chrysler, I finally obtained a dealership from Chrysler Corporation on November the 11th, 1963. Soon after opening for business, many of the Chrysler dealers concerned that I would take away their black customers organized to undersell me. These attempts failed because I had built my business on a basic philosophy that you have to be competitive, charge fair prices, and at the same time show a profit. By early 1965, we had a record of 85 deliveries per month. My hard work and fairness eventually won over the dealers who organized against me. This was dramatically illustrated in 1969 when they all voted for me to receive the Benjamin Franklin Quality Dealer Award from the Saturday Evening Post magazine and Time magazine Quality Award. The day I received the Benjamin Franklin Quality Dealer Award, and Time Magazine Quality Dealer Award was a culmination of a dream come true. But there were still other dreams to make real. I wanted to pass on the lesson of my success to others. 
with support from the Small Business Administration and the Greater Detroit Chamber of Commerce. Al Harmon and I developed a training course to prepare minorities for positions in the auto industry and business. During the 1950s and 60s, as African Americans fought for civil rights, I supported Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and participated in the historic march down Woodward Avenue in 1963. Mayor Albert E. Cobo appointed me to the Community Relations Commission, and I served until 1961. I was called to serve the city of Detroit as its first black director of transportation. The most valuable advice I could give a young person is that while much has changed since I arrived in Detroit over 60 years ago, one truth remains. You must believe that you can make a difference in the world.